next week. The epistle for today's Mass, taken from St. Paul to the Colossians, chapter 1. Brethren, we cease not to pray for you and to beg that you may be filled with the knowledge of the will of God and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of God in all things, pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to the power of his glory, in all patience and long suffering and with joy, giving thanks to God the Father, who hath made us worthy to be partakers of the lot of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the remission of sins. The Holy Gospel. It's taken from St. Matthew, chapter 24. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, When you shall see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, he that readeth, let him understand. Then they that are in Judea, let them flee to the mountains. And he that is on the mountains, and he that is on the housetop, let him not come down to take anything out of his house. And he that is in the field, let him not go back to take his coat. And woe to them that are with child, and that give that nurse in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath, for there shall be that great tribulation such as has not been found from the beginning of the world until now, neither shall be. And at last those days have been shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say to you, Lo, oh, here is Christ, or there, do not believe him, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told it to you beforehand, if therefore they shall say to you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go ye not out. Behold, he is in the closets. Believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east, and appeareth even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Wheresoever the body shall be there, shall they also the eagles be gathered together. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be removed. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with with much power and majesty. And he shall send his angels with a trumpet and a great voice, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest parts of the heavens to the utmost bounds of them. And from the fig tree learn the parable, for the branch thereof is now tender, and the leaves come forth, you know that summer is near. So also, when you shall see all these things, know ye that it is nigh even at the doors. Amen, I say to you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Those are the words of the Holy Ghost. Forty years ago, on November the 21st of this year, 40 years ago, Archbishop Lefebvre wrote his great public declaration, <coughs> which was written to the Pope, written to all the cardinals and bishops of Rome, and to all the Catholics throughout the world. It was mainly in response to the visit of a modernist cardinals 
who came to the seminary in Cologne in 1974, and they were doubting the resurrection, they were promoting uh, um, priests getting married and so forth. So scandalized by the modernism of these cardinals from Rome, the Archbishop responded. So it's worth to go through it again very briefly. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here he goes. Uh, we hold fast. We hold fast with all our heart and with all our soul to Catholic Rome, the guardian of the Catholic faith, and of the traditions necessary to preserve this faith. To eternal Rome, mistress of wisdom and truth. And this is clear. This is our stand. But listen to the distinction that has been dropped by Menzingen. We refuse, on the other hand, and have always refused, to follow the Rome of neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies, which were clearly evident in the Second Vatican Council, and after the Council, and all the reforms which issued from it. So the Council ended in 1965, Archbishop Lefebvre already in 1969 started the seminary. Uh, and in 1970, he got the approval. So in, in that meantime, he was seeing the, the collapse. He, had, he resigned from the Holy Ghost Fathers, and he had many people appealing to him, what can we do? Where can I send my son to the seminary? So Archbishop Lefebvre was right in the middle of this explosion, or what he would call World War III. So notice the distinction he always kept. We stay with Catholic Rome, Rome eternal. But we must refuse, to save our soul, we must refuse the modernist Rome, the conciliar church. He keeps that distinction. And he also says later in other places, we have one pope over two churches. The pope is head over the Catholic church because he's the vicar of Christ. And he's also the head of the conciliar church because of his modernism. So we have this real crisis in the, in the church of a pope over two churches. And we cannot belong to the conciliar church. We stay Catholic. He continues, all these reforms indeed have contributed and are still contributing to the destruction of the church, to the ruin of the priesthood, to the abolition of the sacrifice of the Mass and of the sacraments, to the disappearance of religious life, to a naturalist and Teharian teaching in the universities, seminaries, and catechetics. A teaching derived from liberalism and Protestantism, many times condemned in the solemn magisterium of the church. No authority, not even the highest in the hierarchy, can force us to abandon or diminish our Catholic faith, so clearly expressed and professed by the church's magisterium for 19 centuries. So here the archbishop admits all the, what he would call the illegitimate mass, the illegitimate priest, the illegitimate sacraments of the order of Paul VI. And that's, this is very, this is very uh, important. This is very important in the light of the doctrinal declaration signed by our Bishop Fillet. And when he signed that, he says in there, that he's, he admits all the validity of all the sacraments of Pope Paul VI. And then he also admits to the new Mass being legitimately promulgated. <coughs> and on doing this, the new Mass, the new rite of confirmation, the new rite of ordination of priests, these are at least doubtful because they change the form. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre and the, the four bishops up until two years ago have always conditionally confirmed those who were confirmed in the Novus Ordo because it's doubtful. And that's why the Society of the Tenth in the past, the old SSPX, generally when a new 
a priest came in from the Navasoto and was ordained in the Navasoto rite, they were conditionally reordained because there is at least a doubt. There's at least a doubt. I was sacristan all the years uh, Bishop Williamson was was in uh, at the end, tail end in 1986 in Richfield and then we went to Winona. It was a very common practice when priests came through who wanted to come to tradition and they were not a sorrow. Bishop Williamson would tell the sacristans, okay, we have to have a private ordination just to make sure that it's ours. So the Archbishop saw this and that's why he, he would never ever have signed that terrible uh, modernist declaration of uh, 2012. We are two years after that event, the signing of that document. We're two years and a half after and now, now many priests and many seminaries and many uh, traditional Catholics are going to sleep and they're, they're becoming more and more open to the idea of an agreement with modernist Rome. And that's the poison of not condemning these things right from the start, as every priest should have done, as every one of the society of bishops should have done. So Archbishop Lefebvre continues, and he, he takes the great trumpet call of, of St. Paul. But though we, says St. Paul, are an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you, Besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. Is it not this that the Holy Father is repeating to us today? And if we can discern a certain contradiction in his words and his deeds, this is Pope Paul VI, as well as in those of the dicasteries, well, we choose what was always taught, and we turn a deaf ear to the novelties destroying the church. It is impossible to modify profoundly the lex orandi, that is the law of prayer, without modifying the lex credendi, the law of belief. <coughs> to the Navas Oro Mise corresponds a new catechism, a new priesthood, new seminaries, a charismatic Pentecostal church, all things opposed to orthodoxy and the perennial teaching of the church. This reformation of Vatican II, born of liberalism and modernism, is poison through and through. Poison through and through. Would you eat a nice sweet cake that was poisoned through and through with just 1% strychnine? You wouldn't touch it. And yet we now have society priests and Bishop Fillet speaking as if Vatican II is interpretable in the light of tradition, we just got to take what's good and leave what's bad. But when something is poisoned through and through, you don't touch it. It must be all thrown to the sewer. As Pius X said in his day, the synthesis of heresies, modernism, must be combated by the synthesis of Catholic truth, which is summarized in restoring all things in Christ the King. This reformation, born of liberalism and modernism, is poisoned through and through. It derives from heresy. It ends in heresy, even if all its acts are not formally heretical. This is so important because many priests are arguing, well, Archbishop Lefebvre signed some of the documents, or most of the documents of Rome, of Vatican II. One priest told me he signed 95% of, of the Vatican II documents. Therefore, we should accept 95% of the Vatican II documents. But no, Archbishop Lefebvre says, this reformation of Vatican II derives from heresy, religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality, freedom of conscience, and, and so forth, and uh, especially the, the smashing of the first commandment. It derives from heresy and ends in heresy, even if all its acts are not formally heretical. Even if some of the documents can appear somewhat Catholic. But this is how the enemy works. If you read the works of Martin Luther, there's a lot in there that's going to be Catholic. But it's mixed in with his heresies. And same with Vatican II. That's why St. Pius X condemned modernists 
for speaking in an ambiguous and double way, or mixing truth with error. And that's what the doctrinal declaration signed by Bishop Fillet is all about. It's, it's completely mixed with error. And the Vatican II documents. And Pope Paul VI, if you read his speeches, read his writings, you got a continual doublespeak. He says traditional things, and then somewhere elsewhere he'll say modernist things that completely overturn what he just said. And uh, Bishop Fillet seems to be following this kind of pattern. He continues, It is therefore impossible for any conscientious and faithful Catholic to espouse this Reformation or to submit to it in any way whatsoever. The only attitude of faithfulness to the Church and Catholic doctrine in view of our salvation is a categorical what? Dialogue, a categorical openness, a categorical uh, willingness to make an agreement as long as there's some uh, give and take. No. Listen carefully to these great words of Archbishop of Fed. The only attitude of faithfulness to the Church and Catholic doctrine is a categorical refusal to accept this Reformation. <coughs> That has been the stand of the SSPX, the old SSPX, for 42 years, until two years ago. And now they're opening, the, 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 the dams are broken down, and they're crumbling. They're being eroded and eroded, and now more and more priests and faithful are opening to the idea of, we can work with Vatican II, we can work with the modernists in Rome. Very poisonous. That is why without any spirit of rebellion, Without any spirit of rebellion, bitterness, or resentment, we pursue our work of forming priests. So you see what's dearest to the heart of this great bishop, Archbishop Lefebvre. He always, just like we tell you parents, we tell Catholic young couples, you got to take, if you get married, you take the cross of marriage, and you take the children that God sent you. <coughs> You take the children God sends you, and you don't have the right to stop and limit and space the children that God wants to give. Increase and multiply is His command. So we priests always say this. It's the teaching of the Catholic Church, the teaching of Almighty God Himself. And our Lord Himself says, let the children come to me. He wants the married couple to, pr to bring forth children and to raise them for heaven. It's not just having them, but also raising them for heaven. Remember the parable of the fig tree. Our Lord looked for fruits. He looks at every marriage and looks for fruits. And some marriages, it's true, they can't have children or can only have a few because of medical reasons. And they must accept that as a cross and do good with that. But most couples, our Lord looks for fruits. And He doesn't see the fruits that He expects. And remember what happened in the Gospel. Our Lord had mercy and He waited a year. And He waited longer. But when there was no fruits, He chopped it down. And that is, those married couples who refuse children, refuse to take the children God sends, that hurts our Lord very much. Because it might be the last child in the line of 18 or 20 or 15 or 14 or 10 or 8. As many as God gives, that will be the saints. And how many times this has happened in the lives of saints? St. John Bosco was not one or two child. He was in the middle of, I think, eight, eight children. And uh, St. Catherine of Siena, a large family, the last, the 23rd child. Uh, Mother Mary Elias of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, another similar saintly Carmelite like St. Teresa. She was the 18th child out of 20. So if those parents thought, well, 10 is enough, we would never have had these saints. Or 3 is enough. You cannot say that. So we say that to the, to the married couples. Be fruit trees of our Lord that are blessed and, and give many fruits for heaven. But priests, how do priests and bishops,
bishops practice spiritual contraception. How do they do it? By not encouraging vocations. And you see in the heart of Bishop Archbishop Lefebvre, it's the priests. It was closest to his heart and mind is to have seminaries, to have children for our Lord Jesus Christ, to have soldiers, battlers, holy priests. And this is the, the spiritual children, so to speak, spiritual fructifying of bishops and good priests. They encourage vocations in the religious life for nuns, the brothers for men, and the priesthood. So you see what's closest to his heart here. That is why uh, we are persuaded um, we can render no greater service to the Catholic Church and to the Pope and to pos posterity. That is why we hold fast to all that has been believed and practiced in faith, morals, liturgy, teaching of the Catechism, formation of the priests. Formation of the priests. Seminaries were the first thing in his mind after the crisis of the Church. And he started helping young men go to this university, go to that university, go to that seminary, and they would come back and say, no, they're teaching modernism. And so he thought, all right, I'll send them to Freiburg. At least they're more conservative. And he discovered they're not. They were also infiltrated in modernism. So he saw, I have to start a seminary on my own. But how can I do it? I'm an old bishop. And, but God led him. And we are kind of in the same situation now. That's why we, that's why we have uh, the seminary under Father Chazal with four seminaries in Asia. The Avrier Fathers, the Dominicans, with 27 members of priests and brothers, they are accepting uh, vocations to train for the priests. And they told us in Kentucky, they'll be willing to take our young men to help form them also, to help us. And then in Kentucky we have right now 12, and by the end of this week 13, and maybe a few more, studying for the priesthood. It'll be a six-year, normally a six-year program, some maybe a little more, some maybe a little less if they've had previous training, such as we have an Indian doctor, a medical doctor, who had not only studied medicine, but also studied four years in the Holy Cross Seminary in Australia, and two years he spent in Avrian. So he's only going to need a year, and Bishop Williamson will ordain him, God willing, next June 2015. So you see the heart of the good, the great archbishop, formation of the priests. And this is how priests have, so to speak, spiritual children, encouraging vocations, and the, and the boys' schools, and the girls being guided to be generous with God. Formation of the priests. We hold fast to all that has been believed in practice in the faith, morals, liturgy, teaching of the catechism, Formation of the priests and institution of the church. By the church of all time. Not this modern conciliar church. The church of all time, of all the great popes who spoke fearlessly, condemning the modern errors, and fearlessly holding high the light of the Catholic truth against the attacks of all the Freemasons and the Jews and the Protestants and the enemies of Jesus Christ and the communists as well. Up until Pius XII, they fought. John the 23rd caved in. To all these things, as codified in those books, the saw day before the modernist influence of the Council. This we shall do until such time that the true light of tradition dissipates the darkness obscuring the sky of eternal Rome. In other words, there is no agreement with Rome, no compromise with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. He says this so frequently, I don't know how they can misinterpret Archbishop Lefebvre and say he always wanted an agreement with modernist conciliar Rome. He did not. He always wanted an agreement with Catholic Rome, yes. But that's not the case until Rome converts. And I urge you, listen carefully to his sermon of 1988, night of January 30th, excuse me, June 30th, when he consecrated the four bishops. Listen carefully to that sermon. Read the text. You see, three times he emphatically insists no agreement with Rome, no compromise until Rome comes back to the Catholic tradition. By doing this, with the grace of God, 
and the help of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that of St. Joseph and St. Pius X, we are assured of remaining faithful to the Roman Catholic Church and to all the successors of Peter, and of being the faithful dispensers of the mysteries of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This concludes his great declaration. And you see the heart of a, of a, of a father, of a bishop. You see the heart of a, of a true fighter, a warrior, a lieutenant in the army of our Lord Jesus Christ, which bishops are. Bishops are the lieutenants. And so this is the great anniversary 40 years ago of this declaration. It still applies more than ever now. If Bishop Follet would come out and condemn all his documents he signed and all his interviews and all his nonsense and modernist speech, if he condemns all that and just held this high again, the society could recover. But right now, until they do, the society is eroding and it's eroding fast. And that's the, the old SSPX. And that's why we want to just continue the Society of Pius X that Archbishop of Feb wanted to found, wanted to, to work. And we put all this in God's hands because humanly speaking, <laughs> humanly speaking, there is no hope. But divinely speaking, there is all the hope. God, nothing is impossible with God. And we must trust in Him and in the promise of the Virgin Mary of her triumph. I also want to remind you today, November 23rd, today, in 1927, Mom. was the great martyrdom of Father Pro in Mexico during the persecution. And he would go around saying Mass like a true missionary, dressed in disguise, dressed as a plumber, dressed as a milkman. <coughs> uh, He'd have his cigar in his mouth. One time he, he was going to say mass for uh, some faithful in the basement of a, of a house. And uh, he noticed the guards just turned the corner. And the guards were on the watch for priests. So Father Pro grabbed this lady's arm and he said, just act like my, you're my wife. And uh, she played along and he walked uh, you know, very much like a gentleman, and as they passed the guards, uh, he was able to turn the corner and go say mass in his confession. Uh, another time he was actually asked, have you seen Father Crow by one of the guards? And he said, well, let me go in this house, I'll, ch I'll talk to these people, give me a few hours, and I'll come back and tell you. So he went in, got in his cassock, heard confessions, said Mass, gave Holy Communion, gave a little catechism, encouraged them to keep the faith, read the book of Maccabees, as the priests of the Christeros always told them, read the book of Maccabees. And then, uh, after all that, Father Pro came back out and he said, well, they say they see him around here once in a while, just keep your eyes open. Just keep your eyes open. So Father Pro, uh, he was very successful, he was very ingenious, uh, he was a comedian, a, a real comedian, and, um, and a holy and good priest. However, he was betrayed. He wasn't betrayed by a Freemason, he wasn't betrayed by a Protestant, he was betrayed by a traditional Catholic. He was betrayed by a traditional Catholic, one of the Christeros. He was betrayed by it. So when he was finally arrested and captured, he, he was in prison. Also his brother, Umberto, and uh, a few others, Luis Vilches. Father Pro was the first to be shot. And he went in front of the fire squad. He knelt down and prayed. He had the rosary in his hand. He prayed and he surrendered his soul to our Lord. He probably, I have no doubt, he united his death with our Lord on the cross. This is what we all want to do when we die. And he offered his life for the conversion of Mexico and the triumph of the heart of Mary. And when he stood up, he made, he refused blindfold, he held the rosary in his hand and he shouted, Viva Cristo Rey. 
and he was uh, instantly shot, and to make sure they were, he was dead, they walked up to his head and blew his brains right out. And uh, Kayez, the president, the Freemasons, wanted this publicized to scare the Catholic people and cower them down. But the opposite had to happen. When they brought his body out with the other martyrs, the whole streets filled with the singing of the song in Spanish. It's called Tu Reinarás. And um, a magnificent melody and hymn to Christ the King. Everyone started singing this. And instead of fearing the Catholic people, they rose up stronger. The Cristeros fought more bravely. So these were the great, uh, this was the great anniversary also of such a great martyr. Also, Luis Vilches, he's another long story, but Luis Vilches was another uh, a layman who was very devout. He was part of the Cristeros. And um, when he stood before the firing squad, he opened his chest. And like the Cristeros often do, they have a crucifix they can wear on their chest. And on his bare chest, they saw his crucifix. And he told the, the Masons, he said, shoot here. I'll show you how a Catholic dies. And he was shot, and their souls went straight to heaven. So pray to Father Pro in this Holy Mass as well. That we have the spirit of the true priesthood, the spirit of the martyrs, and a strong faith to live in a state of grace, to grow in the love of God, and to uh, fight for His kingship. Firstly, in our soul, our families, and in our parishes and nations, as in the whole, restore the crown to Christ the King. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us. Pray for us. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us. Pray for us. Mary conceived without sin, pray for us,